to all who have joined us by WebEx for standing by. Welcome to the open meeting of the Public Company Accounting Oversight Board. During the meeting, you'll be in listen-only mode. As a reminder, this meeting is being recorded and a recording is expected to be made available on the PCAOB website. I would now like to turn to Chair Williams to formally convene the meeting. Thank you, Phoebe. Good afternoon and welcome everyone. This is an open meeting of the Public Company Accounting Oversight Board on November 18th, 2022. We welcome those of you who have joined us today by webcast or dialing into the teleconference. Before we proceed with the agenda, I will note for the record that all board members are participating in this meeting and we are able to hear one another. The first order of business before the board today is a staff recommendation that the board propose for public comment a new quality control standard, along with other amendments to PCAOB standards, rules, and forms. To present the staff's recommendation, I will turn to our chief auditor, Barbara Vanage. Thank you, and good afternoon, Chair Williams and board members as Barte, Ho, Stein, and Thompson. The Office of the Chief Auditor is pleased to recommend that the board issue a proposal related to the board's quality control standard. The board issued a concept release in this area in 2019 and has since developed a new standard in response to public comment. We are recommending a new PCOB quality control standard, which we refer to as QC1000, that we believe would lead registered public accounting firms to significantly improve their QC systems. Effective QC systems are crucial for supporting the consistent performance of high quality audits and other engagements under PCOB standards. We have developed an integrated risk-based standard that we believe could be applied by firms of varying size and complexity. Today, we are recommending that the board seek public comment on QC1000, as well as other proposed amendments to PCOB standards, rules, and forms. We have analyzed and developed responses to the public comments received on the 2019 concept release. In addition, we've continued to monitor audit firms practice in this area by reviewing their updated policies and procedures and by analyzing information gathered through inspection and enforcement activities. We have also closely monitored the activities of other audit standards vetters. The proposal in front of you takes an approach it substantially reflects the discussion in the December 2019 concept release, which most comments are supported. I would like to acknowledge the many people within the PCOB who provided significant contribution to this project. Uh, specifically, I would like to express my sincere appreciation to the team that led this project, Jessica Watts, Karen Wiedemann, Ekaterina Disna, Lynette Kleindens, and Skylar Sims from the Office of the Chief Auditor, as well as the, as the rest of our OCA colleagues who consulted on their areas of subject matter expertise and provided other support. I would also like to thank our colleagues from other divisions for their contributions, in particular, Michael Gerbett, Nick Galunik, and Dylan Racier in the Office of Economic and Risk Analysis, Drew Dropkin, Jennifer Williams, and Connor Rasso in the Office of General Counsel, Eugene Theron in the Division of Registration and Inspections, John Abel, Bill Ryan, and Ray Ham in the Division of Enforcement Investigation, and Brandy Boykin from the Office of Communications and Engagement. I would also like to thank the staff in the Professional Practice Group in the Office of the Chief Accountant of the Securities and Exchange Commission for their support and timely assistance with this project. Lynette Kleindens, Ekaterina Disna, and Skylar Sims of the Office of the Chief Auditor will provide an overview of the proposal and then Michael Gerbett, Acting Director of the Office of Economic and Risk Analysis, will provide some additional remarks followed by our recommendation. Lynette. Thank you, Barb. Thank you, Barb. Good afternoon, Chair Williams and board members. First, I would like to say a few words about the basic elements of the concept release. Then I will briefly talk about the comments received by the PCLB and then today's proposal. On December 17th, 2019, the board issued a concept release to explore the possibility of revising PCOB QC standards. The concept release described an approach based on the approach taken by the then proposed international QC standard ISQM1, with certain differences and alternative requirements to specifically address the PCOB's objectives. These differences included establishing requirements that, one, 
align the U.S. federal security law, SEC rules, and other PCOB standards and rules. Two, retain important topics in current PCOB QC standards. Three, address specific emerging risks and problems observed through our oversight activities. And four, provide more definitive direction to prompt appropriate implementation of certain requirements. We received 36 comment letters on the 2019 concept release. Commenters include firms and related groups, investors, investor advocates, academics, trade groups, and others. We have considered all comments in developing the proposal. In general, commenters supported the consideration of a scalable, risk-based approach to quality control, and most commenters supported the approach of using ISQM1 as the starting point. QC1000 reflects those views. I'd like to start by briefly describing the components and objectives of the QC system under QC1000, and then the scalability of the standard. Under QC1000, the QC system will consist of eight components that are designed to be highly integrated. There are two process components, which are the firm's risk assessment process and the monitoring and remediation process. The six components that address aspects of the firm's organization and operations are governance and leadership, ethics and independence, acceptance and continuance of client relationships and specific engagements, engagement performance, resources, and information and communication. Under QC1000, an effective QC system would be one that provides a reasonable assurance that the firm, its personnel, and others who work on behalf of the firm comply with their obligations under the professional and legal requirements that apply to the firm's engagement, the reports the firm issues, and the firm's QC system. We refer to that in the standard as the reasonable assurance objective. Many commenters on the concept release urged the board to develop a QC standard that is scalable. Our recommendation has been structured to provide for scalability based on the risks to to investors posed by different firms' practices. Fundamentally, QC1000 is risk-based, and it makes it inherently scalable. Firms would design and implement a QC system to respond to the specific quality risks associated with their practice and their circumstances. In addition, QC1000 contains specific provisions that would provide further scalability. We are recommending a fundamental distinction in QC1000 between the obligation to design a QC system in compliance with the standard, which would apply to all PCOB registered firms, and the obligation to implement and operate an effective QC system, which would apply only to firms that perform engagements under PCOB standards, play a substantial role in the preparation or furnishing of an audit report, as defined in our rules, or have current professional or legal responsibilities regarding a PCOB engagement. Our data indicates that a significant number of registered firms do not audit issuers or broker dealers. The proposal would provide for scaled down requirements for such firms, reflecting the lower risk to investors when firms are not actively involved in an issuer and broker dealer audit. We are also recommending certain provisions in QC1000 that would impose additional obligations on the firms with the largest portfolios of PCOB, PCOB engagement, those that audit more than 100 issuers in a year. We believe this scaled up approach may be appropriate because the public interest in such firms is greater given the larger percentage of issuer audits that they perform. I'd like to share an example that illustrates both the scalability of QC1000 and a way in which it would differ from the international and AICPA QC standards to better serve the PCOB's investor protection mission. Independent governance of registered firms has long been suggested as a means of improving audit quality. We are recommending to require firms that issued more than 100 audit reports for issuers in the prior calendar year to establish a governance structure that incorporates an element of independent governance. An oversight function for the audit practice, including at least one person who is not a partner, shareholder, member, other principal, or employee of the firm, or has any other relationship with the firm that would interfere with the exercise of independent judgment with regard to matters related to the QC system. 
to provide you with an overview of the firm's risk assessment process and other additional key provisions, I'm now turning this over to Ekaterina Dizna. Thanks, Lynette, and good afternoon, Chair Williams and board members. The firm's risk assessment process is the basis for a risk-based approach to the design, implementation, and operation of the firm's QC system. The process would be applied to the six components of the firm's QC system that have required quality objectives. Again, those are governance and leadership, ethics and independence, acceptance and continuance, engagement performance, resources, and information and communication. To design, implement, and operate this process, for each of those six components, the firm would be required to establish quality objectives, identify and assess quality risks to the achievement of the quality objectives, and design and implement quality responses to the identified quality risks. QC1000 would specify required quality objectives for each component and firms would have to establish additional quality objectives if necessary to achieve the reasonable assurance objective. Annually, firms would be required to identify and assess quality risks to the achievement of the quality objective. The standard does not specify quality risks that must be assessed and responded to by all firms. Rather, it includes factors for each firm to consider in its risk assessment process. Firms would also be required to design and implement quality responses, which are policies and procedures that address the assess quality risks in order to achieve the quality objective. Quality responses would typically be specific to the firm to respond to its particular assessed quality risks. QC1000 also includes subspecified quality responses that we believe relate to risks that apply to all firms and that would be required to be addressed by all firms. Some specified quality responses are similar to ISQM1, while others would carry requirements from our current standards into QC1000 or provide more clarity about the outcomes to be achieved and actions expected to be taken by firms and individuals. QC1000 would require firms to take proactive measures to address two quality risks that may come up between the firm's periodic risk assessment. To the extent practical, uh, these policies and procedures would be not just retrospective, but also forward-looking, so the firm could anticipate and plan for significant changes. If the firm identifies changes to conditions, events, or activities indicating modifications to the quality objectives, quality risks, or quality responses may be needed, the firm would be required to determine what, if any, modifications are needed and to make them on a timely basis. Let me now talk briefly about the ethics and independence component of the firm's QC system. The requirements in the ethics and independence component are based on existing PCAOB ethics and independence requirements and SEC independence requirements. This includes the provisions regarding independence quality controls that currently apply only to firms that were members of the AICPA's former SEC practice section. Under the proposal in front of you, most SECPS member firm requirements would be incorporated into QC1000 with some refinements and extended to all to apply to all PCOB registered firms. In connection with this proposal, we are also recommending to replace an interim ethics and independence standard, ET102, integrity and objectivity, with a new standard. EI-1000, also called Integrity and Objectivity. The new standard is based on ET-102, but would reflect revisions that we believe would better align PCOV ethics requirements with the scope, approach, 
and terminology of QC1000. I will also briefly talk about the information and communication component. So this component addresses the flow of information inside the firm with regards to things like firm policies and procedures and the information needed to perform engagements and operate the QC system. In addition to internal communications, QC1000 would also address external communications by the firm. And there are many circumstances in which firms communicate information about themselves and their performance to external parties. Some external communications are required by law or regulation, uh, such as communication to the audit committees under PCOB standards or the transparency reporting that is required in some jurisdictions. And others are made by firms voluntarily, for example, in connection with marketing or recruitment efforts. Regardless of the form of communication and the type of information presented, we believe that firms QC systems should address the integrity of firms external communications about themselves. QC 1000 would require the firm to establish a specific quality objective that firm level or engagement level information communicated externally is accurate and not misleading. And with respect to any performance metrics communicated, explains in reasonable detail how the metrics were determined and if applicable, how the metrics or the method of determining them change since the performance metrics were last communicated. I will now turn to Skylar Simps to provide you with an overview of the monitoring and remediation component and evaluation and reporting requirements of QC1000. Thanks, Ekaterina, and good afternoon, afternoon Chair Williams and board members. I'd now like to take some time to walk you through a few other key areas of the proposal in front of you, including, as Ekaterina just mentioned, the monitoring and remediation process and evaluating and reporting on a firm's QC system. The monitoring and remediation process is an integral part of an effective QC system because it creates a feedback loop to inform the firm's risk assessment process. The feedback loop is intended to help the firm identify and assess new and evolving quality risks and design and implement effective quality responses. It's also intended to drive a firm's focus on continuing to improve its QC system with a view to preventing future engagement deficiencies. The monitoring and remediation process applies to the design, implementation, and operation of all QC system components including the monitoring and remediation process itself. And it provides the basis for a firm's evaluation of whether its QC system is effective and for reporting on the QC system. Under QC 1000, a firm would perform monitoring activities to determine whether its quality responses are properly designed and operating as intended, such that the firm's quality risks are sufficiently mitigated and its quality objectives are achieved. The monitoring and remediation process would include engagement and QC system level monitoring activities, determining whether engagement deficiencies exist and responding to them, determining whether QC findings and QC deficiencies exist and responding to QC deficiencies, and monitoring the implementation and operating effectiveness of remedial actions. There are certain requirements within the monitoring and remediation process that are somewhat more detailed and prescriptive than other QC standards. As part of this new approach to monitoring and remediation, we are also recommending changes to the auditor's responsibility to respond to identified engagement deficiencies. Currently, for financial statement audits, those responsibilities are addressed in AS 2901, consideration of omitted procedures after the report date. The concept release discussed updating and clarifying certain aspects of AS 2901. The recommendation before you includes a substantially revised AS 2901, renamed Responding to Engagement Deficiencies After Issuance of the Auditor's Report. Under this revised approach, AS 2901 would incorporate the concepts and terminology introduced in QC 1000 and would better align with the auditor's existing responsibility to obtain sufficient appropriate audit evidence to support the opinion. 
we are recommending to broaden the scope of AS 2901 so that remedial action would be explicitly required for engagement deficiencies for both financial statement audits and ICFR audits unless it was probable that the auditor's report was not being relied upon. Additionally, the concept release discussed adding provisions similar to AS 2901 to the standards for broker-dealer attestation engagements. AT number one, examination engagements regarding compliance reports of brokers and dealers, and AT number two, review engagements regarding exemption reports of brokers and dealers. To prompt auditors of brokers and dealers to take appropriate action if they discover that the opinion or conclusion in a previously issued attestation report was not supported. We are recommending amendments to these standards that mirror the amendments in AS 2901. The proposal in front of you also includes a requirement for the firm to evaluate its QC system annually as of November 30th and reach one of three conclusions. One, that the QC system is effective. Two, is effective except for one or more unremediated QC deficiencies that are not major QC deficiencies. Or three, is not effective. That is, one or more major QC deficiencies exist. As part of this evaluation, the firm would need to, one, determine whether any unremediated QC deficiencies, including major QC deficiencies, exist as of the November 30th evaluation date. And two, evaluate unremediated QC deficiencies to determine whether major QC deficiencies exist. The standard defines a major QC deficiency as an unremediated QC deficiency or combination of unremediated QC deficiencies that severely reduces the likelihood of the firm achieving the reasonable assurance objective or one or more quality objectives. It includes circumstances in which a major QC deficiency would be presumed to exist, as well as factors for the firm to consider when making the determination. We also recommend requiring firms to report to the board annually the outcome of the evaluation of the firm's QC system with respect to any period during which the firm was required to implement and operate the QC system. We believe that annual reporting to the board would provide the PCAOB with important information about firm QC systems in a timely and structured way and would provide an effective and efficient means of gathering information about the QC system. We are recommending that firms report their evaluation on a new, non-public form, Form QC. The text of Form QC, together with the form instructions, are included in the proposal in front of you. The, context, the contents of Form QC would address matters including the firm's conclusion on the effectiveness of the firm's QC system, information about unremediated QC deficiencies, including any un major QC deficiencies, in existence as of the valuation date. For example, the quality objectives to which the unremediated QC deficiency relates, the firm's basis for determining it was a QC deficiency, and a summary of actions taken or planned to be taken to address the QC deficiency. In addition, proposed form QC would elicit certain information about the firm and the individuals responsible for the QC system. Aggregated information about the items required to be reported, just as I mentioned. The areas of the QC system to which any unremediated QC deficiencies relate. And a certification of the evaluation of the QC system by certain designated individuals within the firm. We are recommending a filing deadline for this reporting of January 15th of the year following the evaluation date. The proposed deadline is consistent with the proposed date for firms to assemble a complete and final set of documentation related to their QC system. A few comments regarding the non-public nature of Form QC. We understand that information about firms' quality control systems is of interest to investors and other stakeholders. However, the confidentiality provisions of the Sarbanes-Oxley Act limit the board's ability to require firms to publicly disclose certain deficiencies associated with their quality control systems and remedial actions taken to address these deficiencies. 
We are concerned that making public some form QC information that is not subject to those legal constraints could result in incomplete, potentially confusing, and potentially misleading information that would not serve the interests of investors or other stakeholders who depend on the accuracy and completeness of such information to guide their decision making. Accordingly, we are recommending that Form QC be non-public. However, in addition to requiring reporting to the PCAOB, we are also recommending communication to the Audit Committee about the firm's annual evaluation of its QC system. We think this could enhance Audit Committee oversight by providing potentially valuable information about the firm and greater insight into the audit process. In a context that fosters dialogue and a more nuanced understanding of the firm's QC evaluation than public reporting would permit. Accordingly, we are recommending an amendment to AS 1301, communications with audit committees, to require the auditor to communicate to the audit committee about the firm's most recent annual evaluation of its QC system. This communication requirement would not require a firm to disclose non-public information about the results of a PCAOB inspection and any necessary remediation by the firm that is subject to confidentiality restrictions under Sarbanes-Oxley. And lastly, related to this new reporting requirement, a number of other amendments are included in the proposal in front of you, including the creation of a new rule requiring the filing of Form QC, Rule 2203A, an annual confirmation in connection with reporting on Form 2 about the design of the firm's QC system and whether the firm was required to implement and operate the QC system during the annual reporting period and a similar confirmation to the application for PCAOB registration on Form 1. We believe a confirmation may appropriately put applicants desiring registration with the PCAOB on notice of their obligations with respect to their QC systems, which would apply from and after the time that their registration is approved. That concludes our summary of QC 1000. And with that, I will now turn the floor over to Michael Gerbitz to provide some additional remarks, followed by our recommendation. Thanks, Guy, and, and good afternoon, Chair Williams and board members. Staff of the Office of Economic and Risk Analysis, OERA. The amendments that OCA staff have just finished outlining for your consideration. Our economic analysis, as always, who's establishing a baseline of firm performance and today standards, identifying a need for standard setting, evaluating likely economic effects, and assessing reasonable alternatives. As part of establishing the baseline, OERA staff analyzed inspection findings. While findings have improved over time, our economic analysis found a continuing, stubbornly high rate of audit deficiencies. This leads us to believe that some firms QC systems may not provide the required reasonable assurance that their engagements comply with professional standards. Economic theory helps us identify related market failures. As a result, firms may lack sufficient incentive to design, implement, and operate QC systems that achieve the reasonable assurance objective, and thus enhance QC standards are needed to establish quality fostering QC systems and hold firm leadership accountable to achieving them. The standard in front of you should benefit investors by improving firms' compliance with professional standards and other legal requirements, thereby fostering improved financial reporting quality. An OERA staff white paper that analyzes PCOB inspections data and that we plan to issue concurrent with QC1000 provides more details on this relationship. Firms would face costs to design, implement, and operate QC systems that comply with QC 1000. These costs could be significant for some firms. However, most firms would be able to leverage existing implementation and compliance efforts, for example, IAASB or AICPA QC standards, to mitigate the costs. In closing, I'd like to especially recognize Nick Galunik from my office, for his, ex, for his outstanding work in leading development of OERA's economic analysis for this project. I'd also like to thank our colleagues in the Office of the Chief Auditor and the Office of the General Counsel, as well as SEC staff 
for their collaboration in the development of the economic analysis. With that, I'll hand it over to Barb to present the staff's recommendation. Thank you, Michael. In closing, the staff is recommending that the board issue for public comment a proposal related to the board's quality control standards and related amendments to board standards, rules, and forms substantially in the form provided to you. Thank you for your attention. And with that, the staff is happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Barb, Lynette, Ekaterina, Skyler, and Michael. At this time, my fellow board members and I will have an opportunity to make a statement or ask questions to the staff. We will proceed in the order of seniority and I will begin. Today's proposal is a watershed moment for the PCAOB as we propose to make significant changes to our requirements that address firms quality control systems. Requirements that largely look the same today as they did 20 years ago when the PCAOB was founded. I support the proposal that is before us and I look forward to receiving input from our stakeholders. Firms quality control or QC systems lay the foundation for how they approach audits. When a firm's QC system operates effectively, audits are performed in accordance with applicable professional and legal requirements. Simply put, effective QC systems protect investors, while ineffective QC systems put investors at risk. That is why it is so critical to ensure our QC standards are fit for purpose in today's capital markets. The world has changed since 2003, and our QC standards much ad must adapt to keep pace. That is exactly what this proposal is designed to do. Some key aspects of this proposal include requiring the use of a risk-based approach as a firm designs and implements its QC system, providing that certain firms establish an oversight function for the audit practice that includes at least one person who is not a partner shareholder, member, other principal, or employee of the firm. Directing the implementation of specific monitoring procedures, including in-process engagement reviews to inform firm leadership of potential problems and where to devote resources to address such issues. Encouraging an ongoing feedback loop that drives continuous improvement and conducting an annual evaluation of the QC system and reporting the results to the PCAOB and audit committees. Certain proposed requirements would apply to all firms registered with us, including those that currently do not audit public companies or SEC registered broker dealers. Therefore, I encourage all registered firms to read the proposal and provide their perspectives. I also encourage investors, investor advocates, preparers, members of audit committees, academics, along with all other stakeholders to continue to provide us with valuable input. Unlike changes made to individual auditing standards that address auditor performance or disclosures, the changes being proposed today affect the entire audit from accepting the engagement to planning and performing the audit and finally to reporting the results. By elevating all firms QC systems, this proposal directly aligns with our mission to protect investors and further the public interest in the preparation of informative, accurate, and independent audit reports. I would like to thank several individuals that are responsible for bringing this proposal to us. Specifically, I would like to thank in the office of the Chief Auditor, Barbara Vanage, Jessica Watts, Ekaterina Disna, Lynette Kleindens, Skylar Sims, Karen Wiedemann, in the Office of Economic Risk and Analysis, Michael Gerbet, Nick Galunik, and Dylan Razier. And in the Office of General Counsel, Connor Rasso, Drew Dropkins, Jennifer Williams, and Jamie Hirschkoff. I would also like to thank my staff, my fellow board members, and their staff for their contributions to this proposal. Finally, I would like to thank the Securities and Exchange Commission staff including the staff in the SEC's Office of the Chief Accountant for their support and assistance. I will now turn to my fellow board members for their, any statements they may wish to make or questions they would like to pose to the staff. Board Member Desparti, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chair Williams. 
Um, I too am very supportive of this proposal. Um, well designed and effectively operating quality control systems are fundamental to ensuring that audits are consistently performed at high levels of quality. And I believe today's proposed new standard promises to drive substantial improvements in these quality control systems, thereby advancing our mission of protecting investors and furthering the public interest. As has been highlighted since we adopted our existing quality control standards, the financial reporting and audit environments have changed significantly. With expanded and more complex accounting and disclosure requirements, strengthened audit standards, and significant technological innovation. Audit firm structures and service delivery models have also changed, and across all industries, corporate governance, enterprise risk, internal control, and quality management concepts and frameworks have evolved. Today's proposal is responsive to these developments. Of note, consistent with what was envisioned in our 2019 quality control concept release, as you have heard, the proposal calls for an integrated, risk-based, and scalable approach to firm quality control. Similar to COSO's internal control integrated framework, which most companies use under the Sarbanes-Oxley Act for their internal controls over financial reporting. Under this approach, firms would systematically identify and assess risks to audit quality and put in place well-defined quality controls to mitigate such risks. The scalable approach, as has been mentioned, would allow firms to tailor the design of their quality control systems based on the characteristics and risks of their specific practices. Importantly, the, proposed, the proposal promotes continuous improvement by strengthening requirements for an ongoing feedback loop of monitoring activities and remediation of identified deficiencies. Other proposed improvements that you've heard about that I believe are of particular importance include the assignment of ultimate responsibility and accountability for a firm's QC system to the firm's principal executive officer, along with certification of the firm's annual evaluation of the quality control system. An emphasis on firm governance and on leadership's tone, demonstrating commitment to the firm's role in protecting investors and the public interest through high quality audits. Quality objectives to better ensure firm compliance with ethics and independence requirements. Consideration of the evolving use of firm network and other third party resources and of technology in conducting audits. And expanded requirements to respond to identified engagement deficiencies. The proposal also requires firms, as you've heard, to formally evaluate the effectiveness of their QC systems annually. And, and uh, I think the reporting the results of these evaluations to the PCAOB, as well as to audit committees, is very important, especially to help audit committees more effectively execute their audit oversight responsibilities. Finally, I am pleased that consistent with the 2019 concept release, the proposal does not contemplate unnecessary differences from the international quality management system standard, which I believe could detract from audit quality by diverting firm focus and increasing execution risk. Taken collectively, the changes proposed today represent a significant strengthening of our quality control requirements that I believe will drive a substantial depth change improvement in audit quality. I am interested to learn whether you, our stakeholders, agree. I encourage all stakeholders to consider the proposal and provide us with your feedback. I am particularly interested on views as to the clarity and operability of the proposed framework for firms to identify and evaluate QC findings. QC deficiencies, and major QC deficiencies. By design, this process is qualitative in nature, and unlike with ICFR, internal controls over financial reporting, there is no concept of quantitative materiality. I welcome feedback on how the final standard can best ensure effective and consistent execution over time and across firms. As has been said, this effort has been a major undertaking involving many individuals over many years. I would like to recognize and thank all those currently or formally at the PCAOB who have contributed, including current project team members. Uh, you've heard the names. Uh, I'll say it again from our offices of the Chief Auditor, our Office of Economic and Risk Analysis, and our Office of General Counsel. Uh, I will repeat it because I think they deserve the, uh, the uh, a special credit. Barbara Vantage, Jessica Watts, Ekaterina Dinza, Lynette Kleindent, Skylar Sims, 
Aaron Wiedemann, Michael Gerbit, Nick Galunik, Dylan Razier, Ken Lynch, Jennifer Williams, Drew Dropkin, Connor Raso, and Jamie Hirschkopf. I also want to recognize and thank my present and former board and board staff colleagues, the SEC staff, and my amazing team, Brent Seimer, Katie Driscoll, and Lucia Caramba, for their idea sharing, collaboration, and support. Back to you, Chair Williams. Thank you. Board Member Ho, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chair Williams. I'm proud to be a part of this pivotal moment in PCAOB history. This proposal is long overdue, and if adopted, would be one of the most consequential standards in improving audit quality. The quality movement's history can be traced back to 13th century in Europe with a focus on craftsmanship and then later in manufacturing due to the Industrial Revolution. The United States broke from European tradition in the late 19th century and started its own approach to increase productivity without increasing the number of skilled craftsmen. Although this approach led to a significant increase in productivity, quality declined. As a result, quality became the focus in the early 20th century. Today, quality control is an integral part of manufacturing and other industries involving product development. Quality is a necessity because consumers demand it. Likewise, we could view audits of public companies as products. Consumers of audits are primarily investors because they have no control over the process and are the bearers of grave consequences of poor audit quality. In a recent speech, I highlighted the Part 1A deficiency trends for the US and non-US global network firms from the inception of our inspection program. These trends highlighted that sustaining audit quality is challenging and requires a fundamental, foundational and continuous approach. This proposal is intended to be principles-based and scalable for firms to tailor their approach based on their specific circumstances. The proposal is responsive to the many comments we received previously on the concept release. It reflects our staff's careful consideration in balancing the need for alignment with other international standards in the interest of optimizing quality and the unique requirements of US laws and regulations. There are two areas that I'm particularly interested in reading about what commenters will say. First, impact to the small and medium register firms. I want to understand further the burdens that these proposed requirements may have on smaller firms and whether they are proportionate to the value we are expecting. Facilitating and promoting fair competition in the public accounting industry mitigates the systemic risk of being too big to fail and is a crucial component of investor protection. The lack of robust competition is a well-known dilemma of the public accounting industry. Smaller firms' ability to remain competitive in the public company and broker-dealer audit marketplace is a key factor in the health of our capital market ecosystem. Specifically, I look forward to reading what commenters have to say regarding three requirements. Number one, the proposed design-only mandate for firms that do not audit issuers or broker-dealers, which represent about 45% of our total registered firms. Number two, the proposed in-process engagements monitoring requirement, which would impact about eight medium-sized U.S. register firms, in addition to the six U.S. global network firms. I'm also interested in the preparer's view on the impact of the in-process monitoring to their financial reporting process. Number three, the clarity of the proposed QC system evaluation framework for firms to evaluate its QC effectiveness on an annual basis. I'm interested in commenters' view on whether the framework facilitates fairness to smaller firms. 
The second area is collection and sharing of new QC data. In the past few months, I have heard from many members of our two advisory groups about the availability and accessibility of our data. Providing more quality data to investors for informed decision making is crucial. One proposed requirement incremental to the other QC standards is firms reporting their assessment and other quality control data annually to the PCAOB. Efficient and effective use of data for value creation requires data to be standardized, accessible, and reusable. I'm keenly interested in perspectives on innovative machine readable formats that we may be able to implement in conjunction with the collection of form QC information. In addition, I'm interested in commenters' perspectives on the utility of the new QC data and options to making them publicly accessible within legal constraints. I support the release of this QC proposal for public comment, and I share my sincere thanks to the PCAOB staff, only a few of whom I will mention here. Barbara Vanich, Jessica Watts, Ekaterina Disna, Lynette Klein-Dins, Skylar Sims, Karen Wiedemann, Michael Gerber, Nick Galunik, Drew Dropkin, and Jennifer Williams, among others for their work in drafting and refining this QC proposal. I know that it has been a long journey and I appreciate their professionalism and collaboration throughout this process. Thank you. Thank you. Board Member Stein, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Chair Williams. Um, as the events over the last several weeks have demonstrated, um, effective corporate controls and trustworthy financial statements are vitally important safeguards for the protection of investors. Today, we consider a staff recommendation for proposed standard that, if adopted, would require PCOB registered audit firms to implement a system of quality control that would help prevent audit failures, wrong opinions, and erroneous audit reports. It would require firms to continually monitor and improve audit quality. And if implemented, the standard proposed today would completely replace the current standard, which was written and adopted over 25 years ago. In fact, the current interim standards on quality control were written by the audit profession um, before the dot-com bubble, the accounting failures at Enron and WorldCom, and the 2008 financial crisis. This proposed standard should enhance the responsibility of PCOB registered audit firms to oversee the quality of their own work going forward. During the formation of the audit profession in the United States, a lot of attention was placed on the importance of an auditor's integrity and objectivity. Academic research has found and continues to consistently find that auditor's integrity positively impacts audit quality. For decades, the most widely accepted framework for designing, implementing, and operating an organization's control environment, COSO, includes integrity as a foundational principle. An organization's control environment ultimately reflects the integrity, ethical values, and competence of the people in the organization. Today, the staff recommends retirement of the board's interim quality control standards and the related ethics provisions, which were originally incorporated into our standards from the AICPA statements on quality control standards in 2003. The step the board takes today is a meaningful one. Since 2003, our inspections program has used the interim quality control standards written during the period of self-regulation as a baseline when inspecting audit firms. Similarly, our enforcement program has investigated and disciplined audit firms for egregious failures to comply with interim standards. I know quality control or quality management is often defined by the eye of the beholder, 
So how do I view quality control? In my view, uh, quality control is the process that audit firms use to protect their professional skepticism and their professional judgment in performing audits. By utilizing the tools of professional skepticism and professional judgment, an auditor challenges management's significant assumptions, estimates, judgments, and determinations, evaluates conformity with financial reporting standards and rules, and forms an opinion based on the accumulation of objective evidence on management's assertions and the fairness of presentation. In its simplest form, the goal of a quality control system is to prevent incorrect or inaccurate audit reports. That is best done by rigorously guarding an auditor's professional skepticism and professional judgment. The system of quality control should, among other things, help to prevent restatements of an issuer's financial statements, help to ensure robust evaluation of a company's ability to continue as a going concern when conducting audits, and help prevent degrading audit quality, such as by taking on too many clients with insufficient personnel, or taking on work that it is not prepared to perform. I would now like to briefly uh, discuss the proposal. The staff has carefully crafted what I think is an ingenious approach in the proposed standard, which is mainly principles-based. With some prescriptive provisions, it's scalable depending on audit firm's environment and risk profile, and has um, continuous surveillance to detect and address deficiencies where the audit firm may not be acting in accordance with the applicable professional and legal requirements to prevent audit failures. The most important characteristic of this standard is that it replaces a standard written by the profession with one that is written with investors and the public interest in mind. Further, for the first time, an audit firm system of quality control must reflect and reinforce its role in protecting the interest of investors and furthering the public interest in the preparation of informative, accurate, and independent audit reports. I would like to briefly highlight a few other provisions. Under the proposed standard, audit firm CEOs would be ultimately responsible for the effectiveness of the audit firm system of quality control. Importantly, the CEO would be required to certify in an annual evaluation whether the audit firm system of quality control is effective. Some will recognize an analogous provision that has been in place since 2002 for corporate executives regarding a public company's internal control over financial reporting. The proposed standard would also require the audit firm CEO to designate individuals responsible for the most critical components of the quality control system. Independence and ethics, monitoring and remediation, and operational capability. Moreover, the proposed standard requires those individuals to have reporting lines and regular communications with the CEO. The proposed standard also requires audit firms to design, implement, and operate a surveillance component that can identify both engagement and firm level departures from the PCOB standards or from their own quality objectives. If deficiencies are identified, each deficiency must be addressed, including understanding the root cause of the deficiency and remediating the deficiency as appropriate. Importantly, deficiencies in the performance of audits must be evaluated as quality control deficiencies. This provision highlights the critical element of the system's purpose, to prevent deficiencies. Prevention is the ultimate goal. In order to strengthen organizational governance, the largest PCOB registered firms 
as mentioned earlier, those that issue more than 100 audit reports a year must incorporate some form of independent oversight over their quality control system, which should help decrease incentives for commercial interest to prevail over audit quality. This provisions, or these provisions are in response to the 2008 U.S. Department of Treasury's Advisory Committee on the Auditing Profession report which recommended audit firms' governance structures include independent members with meaningful authority and responsibility. In conclusion, today we take a meaningful step forward in furthering audit quality by retiring the standards written by the profession during a period of self-regulation as the baseline in favor of a standard written to protect investors and further the public interest. In 2002, the Sarbanes-Oxley Act, or SACS, included absolute clarity that effective internal controls required a focused mind with a requirement for the highest level executives at the audit firm to be responsible and accountable for the effectiveness of a public company's internal controls. Today's proposed quality control standards can be seen as internal controls for audit firms. It is both appropriate and necessary uh, during the 20th anniversary year of SOX that we issue these proposed quality control standards. I am keenly interested in hearing from investors and other commenters about the proposed standard and how it can be improved. Um, as my colleagues have mentioned, this proposal reflects a tremendous amount of work. And I want to thank the entire quality control team uh, for tireless nights and tireless days, right, in uh, getting this to us today. Um, and, uh, I, I would like to first and foremost thank Jessica Watts for her years-long commitment to getting us to this day. And I would also like to thank um, all of the folks in the Office of the Chief Auditor, whose names have already been mentioned, the Office of Economics and Risk Analysis, and the Office of General Counsel. Um, we truly appreciate it. Um, thank you. I'm, I'm pleased to support this proposal. Thank you. Board Member Thompson, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Chair Williams. I am pleased to support today's quality control proposal. It is a game changer in our efforts to modernize PCOB standards. I believe the proposal will improve audit quality and contribute to investor protection. A firm system of quality control is foundational to the performance of high quality audits in accordance with PCOB standards. Under the Sarbanes-Oxley Act, the PCOB must promulgate quality control standards that address critical aspects of a firm system of quality control. The board adopted its current quality control standards on an interim basis in 2003. Auditing, as well as the structure of many audit firms, have changed significantly since that time. It is therefore appropriate that we modernize and strengthen our quality control standards. There is no doubt that audit quality has improved under the PCOB's watch, part 1A deficiency rates decreased significantly from just under 40% in 2010 to 28% in 2020. It is important to note, however, that we have seen a modest increase in the number of part 1A findings over the last couple of years. Moreover, we continue to see repeat and persistent deficiencies in audit procedures performed in important areas, including internal controls over financial reporting, revenue recognition, and estimates. These inspection findings suggest that some firms are struggling to meet and make effective changes to their quality control systems. The proposed quality control standard is far more comprehensive than current PCOB standards. I believe the proposal will have a positive influence on how individual Audit engagements are conducted on the firm's audit and audit assurance practices as a whole. The proposal aims to incentivize firms to think proactively about emerging risk to quality control and have an ongoing risk assessment process. Require firms to have a robust monitoring system in place that contribute to effective corrective actions and improve 
audit quality. Emphasize tone at the top and individual accountability. Provide additional direction regarding monitoring activities and remediation of identified deficiencies on completed engagements and expand the quality control related reporting to the PCOB to reinforce our oversight activity. The proposal builds on parallel standards adopted by IWSB, AICPA, and includes appropriate elements of scalability for various size firms that regulate. I look forward to reviewing comments on today's proposal to enhance our quality control standards. I would like to thank the PCOB staff for the long hours and hard work they have devoted to preparing the recommendations before us. And I think it's worthy, and I'm gonna repeat the names again, in particular, I want to thank Barb Vanage, Jessica Watts, Ekaterina Disna, Lynette Clendis, Skylar Sims, and Karen Wiedemann in the Office of Chief Auditor, Mike Garbett, John Cook, Nick Delonick, and Delenn Rasnier in the Office of Economic and Risk Analysis, as well as others that have contributed uh, in OGC, Jennifer Dropkin, uh, pardon me, Drew Dropkins, Jennifer Williams, and Connor Rasno in the Office of General Counsel. Again, thank you, and I have no further questions. Thank you. Unless there are any further discussions from the board, I would now call for a vote on the staff recommendation. Board member Desparti. Uh, I support the recommendation. Thank you. Board member Ho. I support the recommendation. Thank you. Board member Stein. I also support the recommendation. Thank you. Board member Thompson. I support the recommendation. Thank you. All votes are unanimous. The recommendation is approved. The next order of business before the board today are staff recommendations that the board adopt the PCAOB strategic plan for fiscal years 2022 through 2026 and the PCAOB's 2023 budget and then submit the budget along with the corresponding budget justification to the US Securities and Exchange Commission for its approval. To present to the staff's recommendations, I will turn to Holly Greaves, our Chief Financial Officer and, Officer and our Office of Administration. Thank you, Chair Williams and members of the board. I am pleased to provide a brief overview of the PCAOB's 2022 to 2026 strategic plan and the PCAOB's 2023 budget, which is the result of a collaborative effort throughout the organization for much of the past year. The PCAOB strategic plan represents the culmination of robust input from investors and other stakeholders on our advisory groups, the PCAOB staff, and the broader public through a comment solicitation process. The st strategic plan is built around four central goals to help the PCAOB fulfill its investor protection mission. The goals are modernizing standards, enhancing inspections, strengthening enforcement and improving organizational effectiveness. The 2023 budget is guided by the strategic plan and provides the board with the resources necessary to execute its goals to help protect investors. The budget is organized so that the resource needs and performance measures and indicators of each division and office are mapped to the goals and objectives of the strategic plan. The budget for 2023 is 349.5 million. When comparing it to the PCAOB's 2022 budget, which was 310.3 million, it's an increase of 13%. The largest component of the PCAOB's budget is personnel costs. This includes salaries, benefits, taxes, training, and recruitment costs. These costs total 258.1 million and it accounts for about three-fourths of our budget. The resource level assumes that 926 positions will be filled by the end of 2023. This is 35 more positions than we had in the 2022 budget. I'll turn now to non-personnel costs. First, consulting and professional fees at 26.5 million accounts for 8% of our budget. 
for rent and facilities costs, including capital expenditures. The budget provides 20.4 million, which represents a six, which represents 6% of the PCOB's budget. The budget includes 19.2 million in travel related cost, which accounts for 5% of the budget and inspections related travel accounts for the majority of these costs. The information technology expense category, which includes costs for things like software licenses, network and telecommunication services is 14.9 million or 4% of the budget. Finally, the administrative expenses category, which includes things like subscription and library costs, business insurance and event costs is 10.5 million. And this makes up the remainder of the budget or about 3%. All of our budgeted costs are funded through the accounting support fee that's assessed on issuers and brokers and dealers. The accounting support fee associated with the 2023 budget is 329 million in total. The share of the accounting support fee for issuers is 300 million and the portion allocated to brokers and dealers is 29 million. The budget also assumes that at the end of 2023, the board will have five months of reserve operating resources for early 2024. To conclude, I would just like to add that the development of this budget involves many different people. I would like to note my appreciation specifically for the budget team, Jim Kern, Yas Masagian, Alfred Azakar, and Marcia Savidra, as well as the combined effort of all of our colleagues throughout the PCOB and the support provided by each and every one of our board members. With that, Chair Williams, I recommend that the board adopt the 2022 to 2026 strategic plan and the 2023 budget substantially in the form that was submitted before you in accordance with Section 109B of the Sarbanes-Oxley Act of 2002. And I would be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, Holly. At this time, my fellow board members and I will have an opportunity to make a statement or ask questions to the staff we will proceed in the order of seniority and I will begin. I'm pleased to support the 2022 to 2026 strategic plan and the 2023 budget to support our mission to protect investors. Our strategic plan is the product of extensive analysis and outreach. We created the strategic plan with input from investors and other stakeholders, including our two newly established advisory groups the Investor Advisory Group and the Standards and Emerging Issues Advisory Group, perspectives from our staff of expert professionals and the Securities and Exchange Commission. Then we issued a draft of the plan in August for public comment. Thank you to everyone who has provided valuable input throughout this process. We've considered your thoughts, priorities, and ideas, and you will see many of them reflected in the plan. Today, we will move forward as we finalize the strategic plan guided by our mission to protect investors and further the public interest in the preparation of informative, accurate, and independent audit reports. The same mission Congress created the PCAOB to fulfill 20 years ago. At the heart of our mission are the people who invest in public companies, whether they are workers saving for retirement or parents saving to put their kids through college People depend on a sound capital market system to build for their futures. When we talk about protecting investors, this is who we mean. When we strive to uphold the highest standards in audit quality, it is with investors' families, savings, and futures in mind. The people we serve are top of mind in everything we do at the PCAOB, including the four goals in this plan, modernizing our standards, enhancing our inspections, strengthening our enforcement, and improving our organizational effectiveness. The goals outlined in the plan are as fundamental as they are ambitious and will lead us to achieve our core mission. I look forward to working with my fellow board members and the talented staff at the PCAOB as we execute the strategic plan. Of course, achieving these goals will require appropriate resources. The 2023 budget provides those resources to allow us to effectively use the tools Congress gave the PCAOB under the law to advance our investor protection mission. 
This budget provides for an increase in staff in our Office of the Chief Auditor to assist in the execution of our ambitious standard setting agenda. As we advance our mission, it is imperative that we evaluate the standards that were adopted by the board in 2003 on an interim basis to determine if changes are necessary to keep up with developments in the auditing profession in the capital markets. Stakeholder feedback is also critical, a critical component of standard setting. Therefore, this budget includes funding necessary to engage with our advisory groups on a regular basis throughout the year. As it pertains to inspections, the budget provides resources that will allow us to enhance our work to assess whether accounting firms are complying with applicable laws, rules, and standards. As part of our inspection process and consistent with our strategic plan, these resources will, allow, will also assist us as we consider ways to provide greater transparency in our inspection reports, improve the timeliness of issuing such reports, identify opportunities to share useful guidance with the auditing profession, and increase our focus on firms' remediation efforts. From an enforcement perspective, there must be accountability for those who violate laws, rules, and standards. The budget provides us the resources to strengthen our enforcement program by using all of the tools in our regulatory toolbox to conduct investigations and bring enforcement actions to make sure the consequences are commiserate with the violations, to increase the transparency of our enforcement process where possible, and to work with other regulators as part of our enforcement efforts. The budget also provides the resources necessary to improve the effectiveness of our organization. We would not be able to execute our mission without our talented staff, which is why this budget includes resources to enhance professional development, foster a diverse and inclusive workplace culture, and promote employee well being. With these resources, we will also look for ways to improve our coordination across the organization and engage in more efficient decision making. In closing, I would like to thank everyone who played a role in developing our strategic plan and finalizing the 2023 budget. I would like to specifically thank my fellow board members and the staff of the PCAOB for their collaboration on developing the strategic plan. I'd also like to recognize our new chief operating officer, Jamie McNamara, our chief financial officer, Holly Greaves, our budget officer, Jim Hearn, and the rest of their team, Yas Masigian, Alfredo Azakar, Marcia Savidra, and Lorene Rosenberg, along with the leadership of each of the divisions and offices for their efforts on the budget. Lastly, I would like to thank the commissioners and staff at the Securities and Exchange Commission for their support and guidance. I will now turn to my fellow board members for any statements they may wish to make or questions they would like to pose to the staff. Board member Desparti, the floor is yours. Thank you. For uh, 20 years, the PCOB has played a pivotal role in driving improvements in audit quality through our oversight activities. And I believe the plan before us today builds upon this legacy and provides us a roadmap for further fulfilling our mission of investor protection in the coming years. The plan focuses, of course, on advancing our mission through each of our uh, statutorily mandated oversight programs, standard setting, inspections, and enforcement. High quality auditing standards are really the foundation for high quality audits. Uh, since 2018, we've updated and strengthened our auditing standards in the often judgmental and complex areas of auditing estimates using the work of specialists and supervising audits involving other auditors. The plan commits the board to further modernize and strengthen our standards, ensuring they are fit for purpose in the current environment, including with respect to advancements in the use of data and technology in preparing and auditing financial statements. Our ambitious standard setting and research agendas are directly responsive to this strategic goal including, of course, the quality control proposal we just addressed. Per our short-term standard setting agenda, the board will be considering potential improvements to many other important standards. Careful consideration of perspectives across all stakeholders, including from our advisory groups, will be critical for our success, and it will be important that we not overwhelm the system. 
I encourage investors, firms, audit committee members, preparers, academics, other regulators, and others to provide comments on our proposals and actively engage with us throughout the process. The plan also focuses on further enhancing our inspections program and strengthening our enhanced uh, enforcement program. Like standard setting, as uh, Chair Williams mentioned, these programs are vital tools in our regulatory toolbox. I believe that over the past 20 years, inspections has played a particularly key role in driving continuous improvement in audit quality. Building on initiatives in recent years, we will continue to improve the clarity, relevance, and timeliness of information that we share from our inspections, including sharing good practices and other useful insights with investors, firms, and other key stakeholders, such as audit committees. Through our inspection procedures, we identified deficiencies and areas in which auditors need to improve, and we monitor and evaluate firms' remediation activities. This supervisory approach to oversight requires constructive engagement and candid and direct dialogue between the inspectors and the audit teams and firms. It is also imperative that we hold auditors and firms accountable when they violate our rules, especially when such violations are intentional or reckless. Rigorous enforcement protects investors and promotes deterrence. For both inspections and enforcement to be effective, it is important that we maintain an appropriate balance between the two programs. The last goal in the draft plan is to improve our organizational effectiveness with an emphasis on investing in our people and engaging with our external stakeholders. Our success is fully dependent on our highly dedicated, highly capable staff, and we are committed to further fostering a culture of empowerment, inclusion, collaboration, and agility. We are also committed to increasing and improving our engagement with investors, audit committees, preparers, and other key stakeholders, including through our recently reestablished advisory groups. I have considered the 2023 budget relative to our strategic objectives and priorities, including investing in our people. I believe the budget reasonably reflects the required resources to support our 2023 program and operational requirements particularly in light of escalating compensation and other costs and labor market challenges in recruitment and retention. At the same time, I am mindful that as stewards of the fees collected to fund our efforts, we must continually strive to operate as effectively and efficiently as possible. It is important, therefore, as outlined in our plan, that we continue to optimize our program effectiveness, our internal processes, and our information <clears throat> excuse me, information technology investments. I wanna thank uh, Chair Williams and her office, especially Martha Kidd and Rob Ravis, uh, Holly Greaves, our Chief Financial Officer, and Jim Hearn and the rest of the budget team. My team, Brent Simer, Katie Driscoll, and Lucia Caramba. My other fellow board members and the entire PCAOB leadership team for your creativity and collaboration in developing the strategic plan and the budget. I also wanna thank the SEC for their direction and input. I look forward to working together to achieve the plan's objectives to advance our investor protection message or mission. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Board Member Ho, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chair Williams. I'm excited to cast my second vote on the PCAOB budget this time for PCAOB's 2023 budget. As I stated in my remarks last year for the 2022 budget, this sets the foundation for allocating the, re the use of PCAOB resources in meeting our mission of protecting investors. This year's budget also aligns resources to implementing our strategic plan, which I also am pleased to support. As was mentioned earlier, the 2023 budget is 13% more than the 2022 budget. Nearly half of the 13% increase is related to the compensation adjustments needed to set staff pay at levels that are comparable to pertinent private sector pay levels, which have been affected by inflation and other market conditions. To carry out the congressional mandate to protect investors, we must recruit and retain the best talent in a highly competitive labor market. 
The remaining increase covers staffing, consulting, travel, and training associated with increases in programmatic scope outlined in our strategic plan. Recognizing that 13% is not an insignificant increase, especially given my years in the federal government, I expect this board to be held accountable for good stewardship with a view toward greater fiscal restraint and responsibility. Thank you to PCOB CFO Holly Greaves and Budget Officer Jim Hearn, PCOB Division and Office Directors, and all the PCOB staff that worked tirelessly to prepare this budget. I value the public feedback we receive on our draft strategic plan, in particular, the feedback that PCOB should be forward thinking in relation to technology. As I've said before, Technology is the audit quality challenge of the 21st century. That's why I continue to advocate for the transformation of our auditing standards to address technological advancements and stimulate innovation to drive audit quality. Thank you, Martha Kidd in the chair's office and all the staff and public commenters that helped to shape our vision forward. In closing, I support the PCOB 2023 budget and the strategic plan for 2022 to 2026. Thank you. Thank you. Board Member Stein, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Chair Williams. This is an important day. Um, the board's 2023 budget and its linked five-year strategic plan uh, show what we've learned during our first year as a board and the direction we're setting for the future. Um, I support adoption of both. I want to compliment Chair Williams and the uh, PCOB staff for their hard work on both the budget and the strategic plan. Um, the proposed budget's numbers reflect the economic realities the PCOB faces. Uh, like many other organizations, inflation, staff turnover, and the war for talent are affecting the PCOB. The new statement of protocol with the People's Republic of China, it's a major step. But to implement it, we need funding to conduct inspections and, if necessary, investigations without compromising our existing inspection and enforcement programs. Not surprisingly, today's budget reflects the priorities and directions presented in our strategic plan. At the risk of repeating what others have said, I would like to focus on three important takeaways. First, the PCOB is committed to updating our standards, running a vigorous inspection program, and improving our enforcement efforts, all to protect investors and the markets. These programs are linked, they almost go forward together, and the plan recognizes that. Second, we are committed to listening to different views to inform our work. This includes learning from our investor advisory group and our standards and emerging issues advisory group. It also means reaching out proactively to academics, individual investors, audit committees, corporate preparers, audit professionals, and our colleagues at other independent audit regulators around the world. The more we listen, the better we will be as audit regulators. Finally, the plan commits us to radically improving the work experience of our employees. After over two years of a pandemic, this is a high priority for all of us. The budget and the strategic plan didn't just appear. They represent the dedicated efforts of many people at the PCOB. Um, for the budget, I would like to particularly thank Holly Greaves, Jim Hearn, Yas Masagian, Alfredo Azakar, and Marcia Saavedra. Uh, for the strategic plan, I want to recognize Martha Kidd, Andrew Gillis, Randy Boinkin, Annie Yan, and Phoebe Brown. Um, 
And finally, I would like to thank my team, Steve Kroll, Robert Peake, and Jay Watkins, uh, who have uh, supported me and the other board groups as we've worked through this process. Uh, the budget and the strategic plan will help us navigate our path forward, and I support the adoption of both. Thank you. Thank you. Board Member Thompson, the floor is yours. Thanks, Chair Williams. Uh, I am in full support of the PCOB strategic plan and budget being put forward today. My career has been steeped in mission-driven organizations, and the PCOB is no different. Our mission of investor protection is woven into the fabric of all that we do, including our strategic planning and budgeting process. Approval of these plans are critical milestones to pursuing the budget's priorities, the board's priorities. The strategic plan presents ambitious goals for the next four and a half to five years to modernize standards, enhance inspection, strengthen enforcement, and improve organizational effectiveness, which allows continuing maturing of our organization. We have already taken pivotal actions toward achieving these goals. Actions taken thus far include the release of QC1000 proposal for comment today to strengthen a firm's system of quality control, increasing enforcement penalties to deter bad audit behavior, signing an agreement with the Chinese regulators to conduct inspection invest and investigations in a jurisdiction that we previously did not have access to, and hiring our first ever chief operating officer to improve our operational effectiveness. These examples discriminate, uh, dis demonstrate the board's deep commitment to decisively act upon the goals set. This plan will not sit on a shelf. It will drive our daily discussions with and actions taken by our division and offices to ensure these goals are cascaded into all facets of mission-driven work. This will allow people to see themselves in a strategic plan in addition to the strategic plan, I fully support the 2023 budget and overall 13% increase year over year. This increase appropriately incorporates efforts to increase our capacity to support program growth, competitively compensate our experienced workforce, and reflect the impact of inflation. The PCOB recently hit its 20-year milestone as a regulatory agency. The last couple of years have presented headwinds for the market, as a whole, we have not been immune to the challenges presented by the Great Resignation, the COVID-19 pandemic, and inflation. This budget thoughtfully reflects the PCOB's resource needs to achieve its four aspirational goals over the next year. Our mission of investor protection is dependent upon a regulator that is fully equipped with all the necessary resources, whether that be through people, process, or technology. It further reflects our efforts to have balance of increased in-person activities for mission critical work, such as inspections and testimony. Therefore, I put my full support behind the budget uh, represented uh, today. Uh, similar to the statements of my fellow board members, I would like to applaud the staff, uh, applaud the staff within our Office of Administration in particular, Holly Greaves and Jim Hearn, and across the PCOB who have been played who have played an uh, integral role in bringing to life our strategic plan for 2022 to 2026 and our budget for 2023. And like anything, putting together a first a best in class uh, budget requires tremendous level of internal and external collaboration. In this spirit, I'd like to thank the SEC for their input and guidance, uh, Martha Kidd in the chairman's office, um, my staff. Uh, Jennifer Givens, Jane uh, Hutchins, uh, as well as Jay Watkins. And in addition, and last but not least, and very important, amazing collaboration with the board members, in particular Chair Williams and her guidance and leadership in putting the strategic plan together. And I uh, don't want to leave out my work uh, with Martha Kidd, working individually on uh, questions and, and moving the strategic plan forward. So again, thank you, and I have no questions. Thank you. Unless there are any further discussions from the board, I would now call for a vote on the staff's recommendations. Board Member Desparti. I support the recommendation. Thank you. Board Member Ho. I support the recommendation. Thank you. Board Member Stein. I support the recommendations. Thank you. Board Member Thompson. 
I support the recommendation. Thank you. All votes are unanimous. The recommendations are approved. That concludes the PCAOB's open meeting for today. As there is no further business, this meeting is now adjourned. Thank you for your participation. You may now disconnect from the webcast and teleconference.